Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar, welcome to lecture 3 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. This particular lecture is part 2 of the topic fault plane solution. In the previous lecture that is lecture 2, we discussed about different kinds of movements which are possible along the fault including the movement which are happening in the direction of the strike movements which are happening in the direction of dip, movements which are having a component of horizontal as well as vertical. In addition, we also discussed in order to track these kinds of movement which are happening possibly during an earthquake, there are various measures which have been defined including strike, dip and many more things such that once you know the value of each of these parameters strike, dip, rack angle it will help you in understanding for a given fault plane solution or for given values of fault dip and rack angle, what possibly the orientation of fault existing in a particular region in terms of how it appears on the ground surface or the place where it is exposed on the ground surface. Many a times if it is not exposed to the ground surface, it is all it is going to give you what is the orientation of the fault at the level at the, at the topmost part of the fault. In addition, dip is going to tell you what is the orientation of two dimensional plane which is called as fault plane with respect to the ground surface or horizontal surface. These two parameters that is the strike value and the dip value are going to solely tell only about what is the inclination of the line which is in the intersection of fault plane and the ground surface and what is the orientation of fault plane with respect to ground surface. In addition to these two parameters, because these parameters are not discussing any kind of movement possibly happening along the fault plane. So, we will be bringing another parameter that is rack angle, which is going to tell you the direction with respect to the strike in which the hanging wall is moving with respect to foot wall. So, this is going to give uh, directly give you an indication about whether the hanging wall is moving in the direction of the strike whether the hanging wall is moving in the direction of the dip, whether the hanging wall is moving just 180 degree with respect to strike value or with respect to dip measurement or there is some value which is other than 0 degree, 90 degree, 180 degree plus and minus. So, this is going to give possible ways in which two blocks that is block 1 and block 2 which are actually interacting at the fault plane are actually moving and these are moving because primarily because of convection current which are pushing different parts of the plates which we also discuss in lecture 1 in terms of divergent plate boundary, convergent plate boundary. We also discuss some of these in lecture 2. Continuing with the topic of fault plane solution. So, so far based on the discussion we have understood that there is a fault which is primarily indication of some kind of movement happening on either side of that particular line. Fault plane means the orientation of the plane on which the two blocks are moving with respect to each other, whether it is kind of pure shear in the direction of strike or in the direction of dip or a combination of both. Fault plane solution is indicating how based on in situ measurements, because these are important as far as the understanding of the earthquake, the seismicity of a particular region, the orientation of the fault and the governing mechanism which drived or which happened during a particular earthquake. So, fault plane solution, the name solution suggests we are interested to find out what was the fault plane details, strike value, dip value and rack angle because depending upon the rack angle you may discuss it is a normal fault, reverse fault, oblique faulting vertical dip slip fault, strike slip fault. So, all these things will come into picture when we take rack angle also into account. So, fault plane solution in complete will tell you all these details as inferred from in situ measurements. When we say about in situ measurements, primarily we will be discussing or we will be taking into account the recording stations. So, primarily whenever there are earthquakes, there will be a lot of recording station in and around of that particular region there will be recording station located far off from the epicentral region, which will actually sense the vibrations generated from the source and 
have been transferred to that particular recording station. We will discuss this in more detail when we will come to the propagation of waves between the source and the site. As far as today's topic is concerned, so based on the information which we will be gathering from recording station, we will try to find out what was the possible orientation, what was the possible governing mechanism which has happened during a particular earthquake. So, fault plane solution means solution which is going to help you in understanding possible kind of fault plane and possible movement which have triggered during a particular earthquake. This will be important not only to understand what has happened during past earthquake. As we know, higher is the magnitude of the earthquake, the longer will be the duration it requires to store a particular level of strain energy to cause a particular magnitude earthquake. So, in order to understand the governing tectonics, in order to understand whether the slip is happening in a particular direction, whether the offset is possible on a particular fault, what is the correlation with respect to the slip accumulating on a particular fault with respect to magnitude of the fault, how frequently these occurrence of earthquake and non occurrence of earthquakes have been reported on a particular fault, all will be an indication of the seismic activity of a third particular fault. So, fault plane solution will help in understanding not only what has happened during a particular earthquake, but in general what is the nature in which a particular fault has been responding year after year, decade after decade, century after century depending upon how much information is available with the observer. Just continue with the topic of faults, we discussed possibly the kind of movements which are happening primarily because of plate boundary activities or within the plate because of in situ stresses which are mobilizing within the plate itself. So, there will be resultant of earthquake occurrence. In order to demarcate or in order to understand what is the importance of fault, why it is important to know about the fault. So, say some of the examples written over here. So, fault mark the sites where dislocation of the ground, dislocations means the ground initially was in levels condition, but some kind of disturbance whether it is in vertical direction, horizontal direction has occurred because of earthquakes in the near future, in the past also and it can also get repeated in the near future. These possible dislocations are indication of that some kind of movement has been happening in a particular section, that particular section you can call it as fault. Now, as far as any particular important infrastructure is there, we have to have an understanding about this particular fault, because if there is a fault in and around of your study area, definitely it is also indicating that some kind of seismic activity is also building up on that particular fault, taking into account what is the design life of the structure and how much seismic forces are likely to occur because of the presence of that fault and taking into account the seismic activity of that particular fault that will help you in understanding the feasibility of the finalized design with respect to the fault on a particular structure. So, that is why the importance of the presence of the fault, its type, its extent and its effect. What will be the effect we will discuss in coming classes. All these things collectively help you in understanding how much seismic force is likely to be encountered by a particular project just because of the presence of a fault in a particular region. How much region that depends upon generally the importance of the structure as well as the seismicity of the region. It is ideal generally we say it is ideal that you select a site for any kind of construction as far as possible away from a particular fault. The two challenges which generally encounter is first one we do not have complete information of all the faults in a particular region. So, most of the time you will encounter a region where complete information about all the faults present in a particular region mostly will not be available. You will have an information, but whether it is complete or some part is still missing that is to be looked into. Secondly, how many times we have the option to move your project to some different site. Nowadays, we are hearing the availability of land is a big issue. So, whenever you are getting some land you have to deal with whatever possible situation challenges likely to be encountered on that particular site. You have to deal with it and then go ahead 
whether it is in terms of design, whether it is in terms of construction, whether in terms of material selection, but certainly selection or shifting of a particular site will not be the very first step. So, we have to take into account what are the faults available, how we can deal with those faults or how these faults have been responded in the past. Fault can cause instability because faults means some kind of dislocation is there which is primarily resultant in the form of earthquakes. So, whenever earthquake is happening, there will be disturbance created at the source of the earthquake and it, this disturbance will be travel to larger distances in terms of seismic waves. We will discuss these in, in uh, later lectures. So, as far as possible we will try, but how many times it is possible that depends from site to site condition and from one project to another project. But certainly we are clear whenever there is movement it is going to cause some kind of instability to the proposed structure. It is critical to understand the location and the nature of the fault, where the fault is available, what is the possible movement which is dominating on a particular fault as has been evidenced in last 50 years, 60 years, 100 years depending upon how much data with respect to the fault movement is available with us or how much data has been inferred based on indirect measurements suggesting the possible kinds of movement in terms of nature of the fault for any kind of construction of dams, reservoirs, again you have to have a clear cut indication about what are the possible faults or at least the faults which are known, all complete information about known faults should be there with you as far as the dam and reservoir related seismic activity and seismic safety is concerned. At times it has been also seen that because of the loading which is created by the reservoir that can also at times cause seismicity which comes under the category of induced seismicity. So, we have to also take into account whenever we are taking any particular site for the construction of dam or reservoir that even though the fault is not showing significant activity by its intended nature, but because of the nature of the particular project it can still cause some kind of induced seismicity. So, faults can have impact on pipelines, we have seen uh, oil pipelines, so whenever these are running through across the faults also, along the faults also and take into account that possible movement is also happening along the fault. So, we have to be very careful in terms of construction of these pipelines, particularly the foundation as well as the connection between the foundation and the pipelines. That has to be ensured that any kind of movement likely to occur on a particular fault, the connections which are connecting your pipeline with the foundations are able to withstand that particular movement. Otherwise, any kind of earthquake, any kind of movement and the connection fails and then that can lead to major disasters. It is critical to understand the location and nature of the fault while building these pipelines. Similarly, with respect to number of slopes, hill sides, again if there is a fault nearby any kind of seismic activity it is going to trigger, it can cause instability to the slope. Many a time we also see some kind of slow failure particularly in a hilly terrain which are also part of moderate to high seismicity region in a epicentral region or some major fault which has triggered larger or great earthquakes in the distant location that can also cause some kind of instability. Similarly, in case of landslide hazard assessment also the information about the existence of the fault and its nature are also very important. Faults are potential, we cannot deny the fact that faults are potential locations for future earthquakes. So, as far as earthquake related information is concerned, it is not only about the loading it is going to cause, it is also many a times what is the most frequently earthquake causing fault or which is the fault which is more deadly or more hazard causing when it comes to seismicity of a particular region or any particular structure. So, information about the fault types as far as possible in terms of past history as it is inferred from it is very important to know about the fault and its nature that is also going to give you an indication about the possible movement on generated ground level vibrations. Because any kind of movement or seismic waves when it is transferred from your focus or from the source of the earthquake to your site of interest, it will be 
recorded in terms of ground vibrations, ground shaking. You put a recording station, whatever this motion sensed by the recording station, that will be defining how much is the level of ground shaking which has been induced by that particular earthquake at your site of interest. So, based on the expected level of ground shaking, one can design a particular kind of structure. So, in order to have a clear indication about what is the expected level of ground shaking, one has to have a more confident information about the presence of the faults, what historically, what earthquakes it has triggered and how, what is the current situation of that particular fault. That is going to give you more and more confidence about the fault and its seismic activity. Now, there are ways you can, you can have an idea about that there is a presence of fault. One is abnormal behavior of strata. As we have learnt based on lecture 2 and today's lecture, that fault means any kind of possible dislocation. When this dislocation is happening, definitely there will be an abrupt termination of a group of beds. So, there will be soil stratification which in some geological time scale might be continuing, but because of relative motion between two sides of the fault block, now there is abrupt termination or abrupt discontinuity in terms of layers. Even you can see this discontinuity on the ground surface. So, on one side of the fault you might be having some kind of deposition, on other side of the same fault you might be having different kind of deposition. Then taking into account that there are different weathering as well as deposition agencies active throughout, there will be some repetition of layers because of whether de deposition agencies dominating or the weathering agencies de dominating. Similarly, there will be some omission of certain layers which are present on one side, but not on other side because these sides which, which are exposed to the ground surface because of the movement of the fault and if have been subjected to a weathering agency more prominently, then certainly these layers will be vanished or these layers will be completely re removed from that particular parent position. So, feature characteristics, the last one also we can see offset. So, generally there will be displacement along the beds also. So, bed is there and then there is relative movement. So, you can see there because of discontinuity which is also indication of there is some kind of movement is predominantly happening along this particular cross section and that is how it is indication that this particular location is a possible fault. Again feature characteristics of fault planes are presence of silicon sides, polished and stated surfaces, mullion structures consist of larger grooves, furrows. So, any kind of deposition which are mentioned over here, large grooves, polished and stated surfaces are also indicating that some kind of depositions are getting eroded or getting travelled along the fault plane and getting deposited to other stratification. Silicification and mineralization is also quite dominating in terms of fault plane movement and that is why these are also considered as another feature which can help you in identification of possible fault in a particular region. So, fault fractures are the path for moving solutions. These solutions replace rock with fine grain quartz. So, you can often see some kind of movement happening along the fault plane of some moving solution from lower bedrock to upper stratification, which is generally an indication of silicification. Many a times mineralization will also see in terms of faults. Last part is physiographic evidences. So, some topographical features will also indicate that at a particular site the ground is not stable means there is some kind of movement which is happening within the ground. Typical features include fault scarps. So, at certain places you will see one part of the ground is significantly raised and the other part is at its initial position. That is possibly indication of raising of fault during a particular earthquake. Then spring near the foot of the mountains also indication of that there is building up of strain energy which sometimes lead to hot springs also. Then truncation of structures by mountain fronts, these all are easily visible if you study the topographic maps or aerial photographs or even remote sensing based images. You can locate some of these features if you go to site and do for detailed investigation again some of these features can be 
explored at a particular site that will help you in understanding the possible orientation of a particular fault. Some of the features which are indicated over here are the first one you see fault scarp. So, during a particular earthquake the ground one side of the ground has moved up while the other side has moved down. So, you can see over here that that is the particular this particular trace you can call it as fault scarp. On the ground surface you will see that certain part of the ground has been raised while the, the other ground remain its initial position. Then unconsolidated material and scaplets you can see over here getting deposited and some kind of movements to the upper layers are also possible. Third that is figure C you can see then there is a, there was a river, but because of the movement along the fault you can see the sudden change in the drainage or the orientation of the river. So, that is also indication of that there is a presence of fault which is possibly undergoing some kind of deformation. As a result the course has undergone the course of the river has undergone significant change it is not following the general trend which was very gentle suddenly there is a change in the course of the river. D part you can see again some kind of so in the first one you see the, the course in the plan there is some change again you can see in the last part that is figure D that because of the fault scarp again there is some sudden jump in the course of the river that is also clearly indicating the presence of fault and it is induced ground deformation. Figure E indicates triangular facets which is also indication of that because of gradual rise or movement on one side the sediment has started depositing on the lower course and that is how you can see these triangular facets indicating that some kind of depositions which is otherwise moving from this fault scarps has been continuing for some time now and then you can indice, you can actually see these in uh, aerial photographs or in remote sensing based images you can basically see some kind of triangular facets which is also indicating that some part of the ground is actually undergoing a rise and as a result the development of triangular facets has been come into picture. Last one second last you can see figure f that there was a ridge which was continuous, but because of prolonged movement along these possible fault lines there has been a discontinuity or offset has been created along the ridge. So, if you see these kinds of offsets in your actual site condition or in your maps that is also indicating that primarily there is a presence of fault. Last one also you can see there are mountains which are suddenly abruptly ended by means of valleys indicating again that this particular mechanism is dominated by the presence of the fault. So, all these features which are mentioned over here these are topographical features. So, you study the topography of a particular region and look for these particular features in a particular region that will help you in understanding where are the possible faults in a particular region and as I mentioned earlier also the identification of fault in a particular region is a continuous process. It is very difficult to say that all the faults which are located in a particular region have been identified. There will be always some faults primarily the, the dominating mechanism has not been understood or there are faults which have been developed in very recent past. So, this is a continuous process and so is the identification of the faults based on topographical features. In addition to this there are other ways based on which once we go for detailed investigation this will also help in identification of faults. Now, I am not going to be covering all these details in this particular course, but if someone is interested you can look into this uh, literature existing on each of these topics as far as identification of the faults is concerned. These methods include geological mapping, geophysical surveys, remote sensing, borehole data, historical records, field observations and laboratory based analysis. So, based on these methods one can also progress into detailed assessment and identification of the faults which are likely to be present in a particular region. And we should not forget the importance of the fault because wherever there is a fault there will be some building up of strain energy 
and depending upon the rate at which the energy is getting accumulated and the history of its seismicity, it will likely help you in understanding what are the seismicity you are going to witness in near future. So, fault plane solution as I discussed in the beginning of this particular lecture, fault plane solution basically helps you in understanding what is the orientation of the fault line, what is the orientation of the fault plane and what likely has happened during a particular earthquake in terms of hanging wall and foot wall movement. So, fault plane solution gives you an geometry, what is the orientation of the fault depending upon the length which is available on the topography, you can also find out approximately what is the length of the fault and the next part is the movement which has happened. As I told in the beginning, though the strike and dip is going to give you some information about fault plane solution, these are not complete because it is not going to give you any indication about the movement which has happened during a particular earthquake, but fault plane solution will give you that part also. So, in order to describe the geometry of the fault, suppose I am interested to understand a particular fault, but based on the existing literature. So, what I will do? I will search for possible fault plane solution. Fault plane solution is kind of ready made solution which will help you in understanding what kind of strike, what is dip and possible orientation or in terms of whether it was strike slip fault, whether it was dip slip fault, whether it was normal fault, reverse fault, oblique fault, vertical dip fault or strike slip fault. All these things one can understand just by looking at the fault plane solution which are many a times readily available. The best part with fault plane solution, it will help, it will develop an understanding about a particular fault and if you continue this for number of faults which are present in a particular region, that will help you in understanding in overall how a particular region is responding in a definite time interval in terms of earthquakes, in terms of uh, building up of strain energy in terms of and, and further you can correlate with respect to possible ground shaking each of these earthquakes, each of these faults which are going to trigger to a nearby structure or to a recording station. So, seismograms obtained at different recording stations, so basically seismograms are the records that will help you as you obtain from different different recording stations. You take these and these will in, uh, once you start analyzing these, these will help you in understanding what kind of not only the ground motion detail that will also help you in understanding what kind of fault plane solution, what kind of dominating movement which has triggered during a particular earthquake. Consider an example of 2015 Nepal earthquake. So, if I am interested to know what had happened during a particular earthquake in terms of movement of a particular fault which triggered that particular earthquake. I can simply go to literature and find out or based on the recordings which are available in that particular region and if I am able to develop the fault plane solution which are given in uh, different ways, then I can understand what kind of movement had triggered during 2015 Nepal earthquake or the earthquake which has happened in February in Turkey. So, if I am interested to know again what was the dominating fault mechanism, again I can look into the recordings which have happened in the epicentral region and can come up with a possible fault plane solution or if the fault plane solution is existing there, I can check that and then see whether it was oblique faulting, strike slip faulting, dip slip faulting and so on and so forth. So, the technique has advantage of the fact that the pattern of radiated seismic energy is taken into consideration. So, we are not putting some sensor right at the epicenter, but whatever has been sensed after this particular earthquake has happened on the recording station which are installed in and around of that, that itself. So, recordings not at the source, but the recording which have happened other than the fault plane actually helping me in understanding what is happening at the fault plane. So, there are different ways primarily you take into account the polarity of first P wave motion at the recording station. What are the different kinds of wave? We will if you go through uh, Later lectures, you will come across what are the different kinds of waves. As far as this lecture is concerned, you just focus on that whenever there is earthquake, different kinds of wave will be generated. Primary wave will be the first one which will be reaching the recording stations. So, taking that primary wave signature 
or the first arrival of primary waves nature or polarity into account that itself is indicating what kind of movement which has happened during a particular earthquake on a particular fault. So, fault plane solution you can derive from the nature of first P wave motion as arrived at different recording stations. Now, you can see over here the first P wave motion which has been recorded at different recording stations during a particular earthquake. Now, you see over here the picture shows two planes one is you can see over here there are two blocks block 1 block 2 consider an example of strike slip faulting. So, along this particular fault block the movement is happening like this. So, this this is my fault plane and the two blocks are moving like this. Yeah, this particular figure is showing you indication of the movement of two blocks along the strikes. So, you can say maybe this is the direction of the strike. So, here in this particular figure you can see a possible fault plane which is given over here and then perpendicular to the fault plane there is another plane which is called as auxiliary plane. Remember in actually in, in, in physical uh, interpretation there is no auxiliary plane we will understand the importance of auxiliary plane later. So, there is a fault plane along which the two blocks are moving. So, you can call this as fault block 1 and you can call this as fault block 2. The two are moving with respect to each other considering an example of strike slip fault. Now, when this movement is happening you can see over here the movement is happening along the fault plane, but in order to understand the nature of this movement primarily in terms of first P wave you can see over here that the first thing here it is experiencing some kind of dilation or if I put a recording station over here you see with respect to this recording station this block is moving away. So, this recording station will experience tension. Similarly, if there is a recording station over here remember this is shown in the plan because it is strikes slip fault another recording station is there along this particular recording station the block is coming towards. So, you will see if any recording is here that will be indicating the first P wave motion as compression. Similarly, if a recording station is over here also because there is a fault and there will be number of recording station all around the particular region. So, we have to take into account the first P wave motion which has been detected at the recording station. What I am trying to show here is there is a fault movement when this fault movement is here depending upon the relative motion of these blocks with respect to recording station you will see some part of the fault block which is moving away from your recording station it is possibly indicating dilation because it is moving away. Second recording station where the fault block is coming towards you will see compression. Third recording station again it is dilation because this block is moving up the other side and if there is a another recording station over here that recording station is. So, block is moving to other recording station and that is how you will get compression over here. So, if you have n number of recording stations all across these will help you in understanding what kind of movement where which particular regions are there which are having compression which are the regions which are having dilation. Now, if you go to any recording station take a record take this into account as I mentioned earlier you have to take only into account the first P wave motion. So, you see over here the first P wave motion is indicating upward movement, upward movement is indication of compression. So, wherever recording station is there you take the P wave component and first P wave motion or the polarity of first P wave arrival if it is showing indication of upward movement you will say that my recording station has detected compression. Same way if your recording station is located over here it will be indicating downward movement which is shown over here. So, that downward movement is indicating that my recording station has assessed tension. Similarly, n number of recording station which are located over here you will be able to understand where 
you are having tension where you are having compression in your uh, with respect to your fault plane and with respect to your auxiliary plane. So, taking into account the nature of first P wave motion all across your fault plane, you will be able to understand which particular quadrant you are having compression, which particular quadrant or which particular side you are having. If you divide this into four parts with fault plane and, and auxiliary plane, that will help you in understanding which particular part will undergo compression, will, which has undergone tension. And remember, these are you are not doing any kind of measurement at the fault pl plane, all these are based on recording station. What recording station has sensed based on that alone, you are able to understand whether your recording station has undergone tension, compression and if, if you collectively analyze that, that will help you in understanding the fault plane solution. Consider again there is, so we will be discussing first about beach wall solution. As the name suggests, we will be indicating or we will be studying the beach wall solution or the fault plane solution in terms of a beach ball. Some of you have gone to beach, we have seen this kind of ball which is appearing like alternate bands of, I have sh shown over here black and yellow band, but generally beach ball you will see black and white bands. So, any kind of band like ball which is indicated like here, that is kind of beach ball I am trying to highlight here. So, whenever we go with fault plane solution using beach ball, this is kind of ball which will be indicating to represent the possible movement along the fault plane. Now, you see this particular part, the two blocks are there which are moving with respect to each other, these are fault line, this is strike of the fault, you are calling it as strike slip fault, so again that is strike slip fault. So, there is upward, forward and backward movement and taking that into account, if you have four recording station, some will experience push because of relative position, position of that with respect to the position where the waves have initiated and then the other part you will have compression. So, compression and pull or dilation collectively you take that into account, you will have some primary wave motion as compression, some primary wave motion as dilation. Take that into account, now you can locate what is the region which is indicating plus or compression what are the region which are indicated by tension, we call it as negative which is indication of dilation. Taking those into account, you can draw a circle, highlight the locations which are indication of compression by white and tension, uh, tension by white and compression by black. This is the beach ball solution. So, if again if you see in plan, so this is strikes slip fault, the two blocks are moving with respect to each other. We have seen based on the first P wave motion, there will be movement away from each other. So, there will be some recording station which will be indicating compression based on first P wave motion, some will be indicating tension based on first P wave motion. Take or identify those locations on this particular fault, you will be able to identify the regions which are having only compression, the regions which are having tension. You are seeing from the top, generally beach wall will be represented on the lower hemisphere. So, you see over here, this is the kind of beach wall you are actually able to see from the top or even from the bottom you are able to see the same thing. So, this is wherever you see on a particular map that a possible fault is there and on that particular fault any kind of this thing which is the projection of this particular compression uh, tension zones on a piece of paper that is indication of beach wall solution of that particular earthquake. So, next time if you see a beach wall solution, you will be able to understand that if I am seeing from the top, uh, if I am seeing in the lower hemisphere, then there are the regions which have actually experienced compression during that particular earthquake, there are the regions which have exp uh, actually experienced tension in a particular region. And remember, I have shown here beach wall solution which is clearly you can see if this is the fault orientation or fault line. So, you can say this particular fault though it has experienced strike slip faulting, the strike is also oriented in the direction of north. So, that means if this is my direction of north and the fault plane is also having a movement in this direction, this is how the beach wall will appear. 
of course, right now I am showing you on my right hand side it is going up, it can be vice versa also. So, if right hand side is going down, you will have tension in the black current black zone and tension in the current white zone. So, it will change. Same way, if the orientation of the strike also changes, right now you are showing beach ball like this. If the orientation of the strike also changes, so rather than strike in the direction of north, if the strike changes like this, the beach ball will also change like this. So, four quadrant of compression, tension or black and white will remain there, but that will not be always vertical because that is defined by one line is defining if you see from the front one line is defining the fault plane and the perpendicular line is indicating of auxiliary plane. So, one is fault plane other one is auxiliary plane. Now, every time when we deal with beach wall solution we have to take into account any kind of beach wall solution gives you two possible orientation because beach wall is not going to tell you whether this is your fault plane or this is a fault plane. Once you get a beach wall, you have to actually cross verify with respect to the geology of a particular site, whether this is the orientation of the fault available at a particular site or this is the orientation of the fault available at that particular site. So, one is development of beach wall and in order to find out again which fault is which, which is the orientation of fault plane, which is the orientation of auxiliary plane, you have to take actual geometry or actual geology of the site into account. That is the reason many a times when we search for beach wall solution, you will often encounter term like nodal plane, which is indication of one plane, which may or may not be fault plane and indication of other plane, which may or may not be a fault plane, but certainly either of these two plane will be fault plane and the other one will be auxiliary plane. So, that is how you can get the beach wall solution for strikes lift fault. As we discussed earlier also, there, ca there can be number of ways in which the, mo the movement along the fault can is possible. Again you can see over here, so this is an indication of normal faulting where the hanging ball is moving away from the foot wall, this is your fault plane and again if I try to understand the nature, certainly I cannot understand the nature from the top because the movement is happening perpendicular to your ground surface. So, if I have to see the nature here, I have to see actually perpendicular to your I mean along the fault plane I have to see. Again there will be some there will be development of waves and depending upon which wave is experiencing compression or which recording station is experiencing compression and tension again you can identify because these wave will continue and will be detected by a recording station. So, depending upon the first P wave which will be recorded at the recording station you can again identify whether it was compression or whether it was tension and continue the same activity what we have done earlier, there will be tension also. So, compression as I mentioned earlier by black and tension by white. So, you can again see though it is appearing to the beach wall very much similar to strikes lift fault, but remember this is not the beach wall you will be seeing in plan. In plan you will be seeing the beach wall is appearing from the bottom. So, if you keep like this whatever at this moment you see from the bottom that is on lower hemisphere, this is actually the figure on the right side, this is actually the nature of first P wave motion which is indicated on lower hemisphere, but again this is on a plane which is not from the surface. Remember beach wall I am representing on the ground surface, this is indicating on a plane which is perpendicular to the ground surface. So, I have to again take the projections that is how it will look on the surface. So, what it means if this was the beach wall solution which I can see over here as you can also see in front of the camera. If this is the beach wall solution if I start looking from the bottom or for the ease if I turn this ball by 90 degree you will get something which is appearing very much similar to the one which is. So, this is going to give you me the quadrants of compression and tension as appearing on lower hemisphere on a plane. So, whatever you are representing it is actually on the plan because these beach wall solution you will be representing on a map. So, everything has to be represented in plan. So, this is called as beach wall solution for normal faulting. So, similarly for other fault also you can determine the beach wall solution. Beach wall is a lower hemisphere equal projection of 
focal mechanism. So, you can call it as fault plane solution or focal mechanism which has happened during a particular earthquake. So, focal plane, plane solution or uh, uh, fault plane solution or focal mechanism solution you can say. Now, there can be two planes, one is fault plane, other one is auxiliary plane which are orthogonal with respect to each other. These planes you have to identify based on actual side details like out of these two because these two will be having different value of strike. So, you have to go to a particular site or explore the geology maps or the fault or, or seismic atlas map of a particular region and then identify that out of these two orientation which is matching with the orientation of the fault in actual site condition. That is how you can correlate and identify the fault plane and the auxiliary plane. This is very important because auxiliary plane actually is not there, but in order to drive beach wall solution one has to have four quadrants so that will require fault plane as well as auxiliary plane. Now, here you can see again the strike slip faulting which I have already shown there. So, I will not be uh, covering this particular part once again. You can see everything is shown in the plan. You have fault plane and you have auxiliary plane and depending upon the first P wave motion as appearing on each of these four quadrants. So, recording station which are located over here will have compression, recording station located over here will have tension or downward movement recording station located over here will have upward movement located over here will have downward movement. So, depending upon and again there will not be only two or three recording station you have to have more number of recording station in order to understand confidently and accurately what kind of movement you are dealing with. So, whenever we are interested to develop beach wall solution Firstly, we have to understand where the movement is happening, whether the movement is clearly visible on the ground surface, movement is visible perpendicular to the ground surface or any other plane on which the movement is clearly visible. Again, you can see for normal faulting we have already developed here. So, we have seen if you take a cross section over here and try understanding. So, this circle which I have just drawn it is basically perpendicular to the uh, fault plane. So, again you see over here this will be experiencing compression, this will be experiencing compression, this will be tension, this will be tension actually on vertical phase perpendicular to the fault plane. If you see it from the side that is perpendicular to the fault plane you will be able to get almost like this compression and tension. Again take the lower hemisphere and then the projection on the plan you will get the beach wall solution which is appearing like this which you can see over here also. So, this is the beach wall solution for normal faulting. If you go for reverse faulting again the process remains same, but only thing there will be upward movement of hanging wall with respect to foot wall and you have to interpret where there will be compression, where there will be tension. I prefer to have blocks and then you can actually see upward movement, downward movement and take a circle which is having one section with respect to fault plane and other perpendicular line with respect to auxiliary plane. So, for reverse faulting again it remains the same. So, again if I am interested to find out the beach wall solution over here, I will take a circle which is perpendicular to your fault plane and also to the ground surface and try understanding because this is going up, hanging wall this is going up, this is going down. So, certainly when this is going up you will have compression over here, you will have compression over here okay, uh, and then you will have okay, there, there you will be having compression over here, you will have compression here, you have tension here and tension here. So, this will not be compression, tension, tension, compression and compression because I have to take into account with respect to here if the recording station is located over here, what will be the nature? So, it is since the block is moving away from your recording station, certainly there will be tension over here and tension over here, compression here and compression here. Then take the projection on the lower hemisphere and then transfer this projection to your surface. So, this is primarily you can see this is the beach wall solution on the ground surface uh, on the section which is perpendicular to your fault plane. You look from the bottom you will get this particular beach wall solution which is appearing to me like 
this particular part. So, this center part is tension, this part and this part is uh, this part and this part is tension and the central part is compression. So, this is any time if you see the beach wall solution represented over here, you will see this is indication of reverse faulting. And remember, I am showing here is the strike of the fault is oriented with respect to north. So, again you can see beach wall solution remains the same, but it can you can see some kind of rotation. So, this is C, T and T. So, the difference between this part and this part is that the strike value has changed as a result of which the orientation of the fault line has changed and that has resulted in rotation of beach wall. So, initially the beach wall was like this, now I have rotated the beach wall because the orientation of the fault is basically indicated by these two points. So, that is actual indication of beach wall solution for reverse faulting. Now, oblique faulting, when we are interested for strike slip faulting, you can see the movement from the top. When you are interested in normal faulting and reverse faulting, you can see the movement from the side, but in oblique faulting, there will be combination of two blocks, uh, combination of horizontal and vertical. So, the hanging ball is moving downward as well as sideways. In such a case, if I am interested to know the nature of compression and tension, Certainly, I cannot take uh, in I cannot look in plan, I cannot look inside. I have to take this nature of movement along the fault plane. Again, along the fault plane, you can divide. So, this is your fault line, this is your fault plane, and perpendicular to that, this one is indication of auxiliary plane. Remember, I am able to develop. I am able to draw here auxiliary plane and fault plane because the geometry itself is in front of me. But if I give you fault plane solution, you have to again go back to the site and try finding out which of these two are indication of fault plane and which one is auxiliary plane. So, again you develop depending upon the movement of hanging wall with respect to foot wall, where you are having compression, where you are having tension. I have developed over here, if you take two blocks in hand and then start taking this movement and then see because if this movement is there, if there is a recording station here, that recording station will only sense compression, that recording station on the other side will also sense compression. Recording station which will be recording waves from this particular quadrant will have tension and subsequently here you will have tension. So, again in this particular case, you will have some quadrants of tension, compression, compression, tension like these. But remember, what I am showing you here, it is perpendicular to your line of sight. Considering the orientation of the fault is not, it is not 90 degree dip, but something which is less than 90 degree. So, what will happen? This particular projection, which, which was otherwise perpendicular to your line of sight, it will actually rotate slightly. Indication of value of the dip less than 90 degree. In such a case, whatever you are able to see from the top, from, from the front, that will be indication of fault plane solution on the fault plane, fault plane solution on the fault plane. Now, if I am interested to know how it will appear on the ground surface, I have to take, I have to see from the bottom and at the bottom you will see something like this, what is mentioned over here. This is for one movement and this is for other movement. That is how you will get the two kinds of movement which are mentioned over here. So, if the hanging ball is moving away and downward, you will have these two blocks of tension and the other two blocks of compression. So, this will be called as the beach ball solution for oblique faulting, which is indication of both horizontal as well as vertical movement. Again, one thing has to be taken into account. First part is the orientation of the strike, second is depending upon you can see over here, this is the, dig, uh, uh, the uh, beach wall solution for a particular oblique fault. Now, you keep on changing the orientation or increasing the dip value, you will see rotation. So, initially this part was clearly visible, then after some time you will see only these two parts were visible, after some time you will see the other part started visiting 
visualizing. So, it is all depends upon what is the orientation or what is the value of dip of a particular fault plane on which this particular movement has happened. So, these three four examples that is strike slip, normal faulting, reverse faulting and oblique faulting. I have given you to practice, you can practice and try understanding where will be the development of compression, where will be the development of tension and how that will appear on particular ball that will help you in understanding that four quadrants and remember in each of these quadrant there will be in one quadrant or one line will be oriented towards the fault plane, other will be perpendicular to the fault plane that is auxiliary plane. So, in general, so fault plane solution if you see there are different kinds of movement which are shown in this particular picture. You can see over here the strike slip faulting, the dip slip faulting. I have not shown over uh, uh, for vertical dip slip also. So, uh, the second one was for reverse faulting, then normal faulting and you can see over here possible direction of dip also. Vertical dip slip fault you see half side is compression, half side is tension because again you will be seeing from the top uh, I mean uh, how it appears or the circle will be develop in order to understand the compression and tension from the top. And the last one is of course, about beach wall solution of oblique faulting. In addition to beach wall solution in determining the fault plane solution, you have other way of determining the fault plane solution that is called as moment tensor solution. So, generally if you take the strike slip faulting as mentioned over here, there will be movement on two parts of the fault plane. So, if you take that into account fault plane and strike slip faulting, then two movement will be there one on other side, one on one side and one on other side. Coupling these two you can take into account as force couple of the movement in order to balance that. So, you will apply another force couple that that is how it becomes double couple. Now, the displacement because we start with this offset dislocation every time there is earthquake before that there will be accumulation of strain energy or there will be some displacement which is getting accumulated in terms of strain energy. So, this displacement can be correlated with respect to this double couple related movement by means of Green's functions or you can determine the value of moment tensor by means of g inverse times u. So, that is indication of if you know the displacement and the green function, average displacement and the green function, you can actually determine what is the state of forces and the corresponding displacement which is dominated in a particular earthquake related fault movement. So, u is obtained from the seismic waveforms. You can take different recording station along your recording station and try determining the ground displacement. M is moment tensor and G is Green's function. Taking these three things into account, it can be correlated like this. Again, on the other hand, seismic moment M naught is also a function of average displacement. So, the size of the earthquake that is seismic moment can be correlated with respect to displacement this displacement can also be evaluated by means of Green's function in terms of moment tensor solution. So, moment tensor solution will also help you in understanding what kind of nature of forces which has been mobilized with subsequently using Green function you can also find out what is the average displacement in the dominating directions that is fault plane and other directions. So, here you can see the first one is fault plane and possible movement along the fault plane. Secondly, perpendicular to the fault plane again there is some kind of movement and the last one is equivalent body forces. So, you can see primarily three axes x 1, x 2, x 3 and corresponding to those axes depending upon the movement is along the fault plane or nature of forces perpendicular to the fault plane or an auxiliary plane and these are the equivalent body forces or the double couple. Correspondingly, this can be also developed use, using the means of m 2 1, m 1 1. So, 2 is indication of the direction in which the force is applicable one is the direction in which it is perpendicular to similar to your stress tensor that is how you can develop these force tensors or moment tensors. Again depending upon the directions you can see over here. So, possible three compo nine components you can develop. So, one one m one one is indication first one first suffix is indication of the direction in which force is applicable and second one is on which direction this particular force is applicable. So, if you see m 1 1 means the force is applicable 
in the direction of 1 and the direction of the force itself is also 1. M 1 2 is force is acting in the direction of 1 on 2 2 or the x on the plane perpendicular to x is 2 2 same way with respect to m 1 3, m 2 1 and subsequently. So, there will be diagonal components and which is indication of. So, here you can see altogether there will be these components which are indication of possible movements because the moment tensor is in, is directly indicated with respect to ground displacement. So, you can see over here depending upon the direction in which the force is applicable and the direction on and, and the plane which is perpendicular to a given axis you can have all these components these all will give you a general understanding about what is happening at the point source in terms of average displacement and what are the dominating direction in of application of force couples. This is again I am going to give you very preliminary information about moment tensor solutions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.